It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. In the last episode, we heard from three editors of a new book of Relief Society documents published by the LDS Church. Jill Mulvader, Kate Holbrook, and Matt Groh talked about the origins of the church's Relief Society, a women's organization, and how its activities were suspended in 1844. In this episode, we pick up where we left off as the Latter-day Saints begin to reestablish Relief Society in the Utah Territory. We cover issues like polygamy and women's suffrage, and we also discuss the kind of impact the editors hope this book can have on how Mormons understand their history. We're talking about the first 50 years of Relief Society, key documents in Latter-day Saint women's history. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. Don't forget to rate and review the show on iTunes and tell your friends. So the book talks about, kind of fills in the gaps between the suspension of the Relief Society and, and then little fits and starts where it start people kind of take their own initiative to start Relief Society type groups. Uh, women are still obviously meeting together on the Trek West. They meet together and pray. And, um, and then as the church is becoming established in Utah, women start to get a little bit more serious about the Relief Society. And in Bountiful, Utah, uh, there's a Relief Society established there, but it lasts only six months. Uh, before it peters out. The reasons that it lapses are very interesting to consider. I thought it would be interesting to hear about that. Well, a lot of these relief societies were started at Brigham Young's request uh, to, they were called Indian Relief Societies, and Native Sisters did, were not members of these relief societies, but the women got together to, as part of a relief effort, to have clothing and food to give to Native, Native women who'd been displaced and who needed the supplies. So Sometimes there was a temporary aspect because the the nature of why they came together was temporary. But the Utah War was a tremendous interruption to re- all of the Saints' activities, including Relief Society activity. So this happened in 1857, uh, the Utah War. And so it's not really until after that that Relief Society really starts going again. In fact, there's a 10-year break even because of the Utah War. Uh, where people are just trying to get things together again. It seems like a lot of Latter-day Saints, men and women, aren't particularly involved in sacrament meetings. or in, there, there's a, This is a time when it, it seems like the church has been injured pretty deeply and that people are just trying to piece their lives together out here. Uh, and so what was the women's kind of, what was a common domestic sphere for women during this time period? What kind of things would they be doing? I, I think women continue to do many of the things that they did under the auspices of the organization. Uh, That was certainly true as they crossed from Illinois to Utah. The the women are are meeting to have prayers together, uh, sometimes share spiritual gifts. They're still ministering to the sick and the poor. And those things continued in in Utah, uh, both before and after the, the organization of of relief societies there. As as Kate mentioned, the immediate impulse was to sell clothing for Native American women and and children, uh, something that Brigham Young had asked sisters to do. It's interesting that the first organization in Utah was prompted by the women themselves, just as it was in, in Nauvoo. And I think that tells you that they had a desire to be organized uh, and anticipate the the strength that could come from being together in ways maybe that the men didn't and and Brigham Young quickly latched onto this and and uh, recommended the organization of relief societies in all the wards in the early 1850s, but women are making quilts. Uh, they're they're not ministry- for, not to put on the wall either, right? Like this no. is like bedding. <laughs> like we forget about this like. bedding. Yes, <laughs> and that became especially important as the the immigrants came. In and uh, most especially those who who were caught in the early snows, the Willie and Martin Handcart Company. There was there was a lot of Relief Society support for those immigrant companies, and that continued even though uh, Relief Societies weren't officially meeting. Women women continued to help immigrants. They they continued to to sew for the poor and administer the poor. But on a neighbor neighborly basis, not uh, a collective basis, and that's that's the difference. 
yeah, there were these tasks that they needed to get done, and they'd find ways to do them, but there was still always this almost gravitational pull toward organization. <laughs> they just kept getting pulled back. And they had this book, and they knew the prophet had, had turned this key to them, and it seems like this kind of stayed in the back of their mind, especially some of the, the leading women, that this, this is something we can come back to, this gravitational pull to organization. Health also was an issue. What was the Council of Health about? Uh, how did that sort of play into um, reestablishing the Relief Society? I don't know that it played into reestablishing the Relief Society, but it was an effort that women engaged in to to help promote health among yeah, the saints. Was the, and there was a council of health that had men on it, and, and so why make, because they made a different council. Right. What, mm-hmm. what was the story there? Well, in, in those days, women and men had separate organizations, and, and so they did. They started a female branch of the Council of Health, and Phoebe, Phoebe Angel uh, was head of this female council of health. And we have record of it, not in this book, but we do have record of her uh, giving a speech, which is about one sentence and then a recipe for a medicine. <laughs> so it was very practical. And it, yeah, and there were delicate things like, so for women, um, there were things that they felt women were better suited to talk about or that they felt more comfortable talking about with. Uh, women were often midwives, and so they actually had more experience uh, than than a lot of the men did. And then you had kind of a push on the part of the church and, and to to get professional training even for women. And uh, so women were sent on missions to learn uh, professional mid midwifery, is that how you say? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and to become doctors. But that's what's so exciting. When Relief Society is reestablished, all of these coordinated efforts then ca- can happen. So instead of female midwives here and here, you have women called to become midwives and they go to Salt Lake City and they train to become midwives. And, the, and some of the women who train them are women who Relief Society supported in going east to become doctors. So really the, the, what, what they were able to accomplish is really magnified by having this organization that supports them, sometimes finances their efforts, but certainly helps to uh, define, and define and expand their efforts. So there were other initiatives as well that women became involved with. Brigham Young and and church leaders sort of were concerned with the Transcontinental Railroad coming in and commerce and Gentiles and (laughs) all of these influences. So um, how did uh, did he uh, turn to the Relief Society to sort of help tackle these concerns, address these concerns? I th- I th- he did turn to the Relief Society in uh, December of 1867 by calling for its reestablishment. I think it's interesting, to, again, to see the context around that, that we have uh, the railroad coming, uh, the, the establishment of uh, schools of the prophets in local wards to talk about temporal and spiritual affairs. So the men are are uh, beginning to meet together to address the concerns of the era. They didn't have a three-hour block. Right? No. So. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think it's also interesting that there is a, a push uh, toward immigration at this moment in time with the railroad coming. There's a, a desire to bring along the, the saints before the railroad brings an influx of, of Gentiles, those who aren't who aren't Latter-day Saints. And there's also a great emphasis on building the temple. Brigham Young wants resources to go to building the temple. So uh, while the temple, uh, the poor have been being uh, given their, their uh, in-kind, uh, <laughs> in-kind help from the, the tithing office, uh, Brigham Young wants to see a change in that. He wants, he wants the those working on the temple to receive what they need from the tithing office, and he wants the bishops to take care of the poor in their wards, and uh, he understands they're going to need help, and that's also part of this, this felt need for the organized women to to now re-enter the scene and so he calls for the reestablishment of relief society and there was sort of proto visiting teacher stuff going on too weren't there sort of committees within the relief society that would sort of go around and meet with church members and s- kind of assess the situation see what kind of help was needed is that is it fair to call it sort of a pre visiting teaching type thing they they were called visiting committees and they existed in Nauvoo as well and they would so, so it sort of served as eyes of the church to kind of find out the needs of different members and, and, and so that they could 
act chair so they knew where the benevolent where did where should we direct our benevolence here like where is this needed <laughs> well and i think as the the relief society was reorganized in utah uh brigham young could see that many bishops were confused about this uh the society hadn't existed for 10 years and really only a few years before that we have hundreds and hundreds of immigrants arriving and expansion of wards. A lot of people have never heard of Relief Society. So in that sense, uh, his calling of Eliza R. Snow in April of 1868 to work with local bishops and to try and, and clarify the organizational form and purpose uh, is, is critical to the reestablishment of Relief Society during these periods. Um, most bishops weren't familiar with it. So to, to show them that this consisted of a, a president and counselors, a secretary and a treasurer, and these visiting committees, which quickly were, were, were sometimes known as visiting, teach, uh, visiting committees and were sometimes known as teachers. Um, so uh, over time that became combined and they were known as visiting teachers. So uh, that was part of the structure in Nauvoo that got re-implemented in Utah. And Eliza R. Snow, all the while, had this little book that she had brought with her, this record. How important was that uh, to the Relief Societies? It, it's so important, Blair, and it's important to remember that she's the one who kept most of the minutes in that Nauvoo book, that she's the one who carried it to Utah, who kept it safe all this time. And then when she would visit individual wards to teach them about Relief Society, she would take, it's a big book. It's yeah, bigger than our it? book. How, yeah, <laughs> so no, it it's is, not bigger than our book. Yeah, like, but, <laughs> but she would carry it to the Relief Societies and she would show them. Because when, when Joseph Smith saw her constitution that she initially wrote up, he said, that's good. But the minutes that you take in these meetings will be your constitution for Relief Society. So she took them, the minutes, as the model for the way they could, for the purpose of Relief Society and the way to take minutes and the way to pitch in and help. It's like all, a lot of the effort that goes into imagining what the organization will be like, was all, the work, that work was largely done and it was in this book. Mm -hmm. And so that enabled them to sort of go around and establish. And they use that book as a pattern for other books. And that's a lot of the things that are within the book that you all have put together come from similar records that are based on that original record. And, and women would copy out passages from there, or sometimes the whole Nauvoo Minute, so they would have their own mm -hmm. record of it as well. It's something they really treasured. Yeah, it's labor intensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if there's really one document that I think we would encourage people to read in this book it's those Nauvoo Minutes, just because it was so powerful, so central uh, to the Relief Society. And uh, you don't have to buy the book to read it. It's already up on the Church Historians Press website, www.churchhistoriansprest.org. Uh, and we just feel that that document is particularly so important that we wanted to get that on that website immediately. So that's available now, uh, as well as the uh, the introductory material. That's right. Is the introductory material for each of the sections of the book, or that's just right. for? So that's all there. Yes. Wow. Okay. I'll provide links to that uh, on, and, on and, the blog. And there's some other documents uh, there as well. And eventually, the, eventually within 12 to 18 months, the entire contents of the book will be online. So, to kind of bring it back in, we have. The Relief Society is reestablished in 1867. Eliza R. Snow is uh, heading that up under the direction of Brigham Young. She's using the Nauvoo Minutes. She's setting up, uh, according to the prototype that Joseph Smith and, and the women of, of that era, of that decade established. And, and now we have uh, this polygamy thing. It's always going to come back. It's kind of in the background. It's uh, becoming a public issue. And the government is trying to find ways to crack down on the church. And this is one of the reasons why Latter-day Saint women become very politically involved. So what about the politics of the Relief Society at this time? What kind of things do we see the women doing? Uh, it seems to be a time of, of activism and a time of, of really empowerment for LDS women, where they become public figures uh, on behalf of themselves and also the church. Well, one of the contexts to understand that is how mocked uh, Latter-day Saint women were in the 19th century. The question was, how could a woman in her right mind join a religion that embraced plural marriage? She must have been coerced, she must have been duped, 
or she just must be stupid, right? And, 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 and there's just such an outpouring of literature, outpouring of newspaper reports, just mocking Latter-day Saint women. And they understood that the best response to that would be for them to speak publicly, for them to show that they were articulate, they were intelligent, they hadn't been duped, they hadn't been coerced, they had embraced this because they believed it was divine, that this was the path that they had chosen in life. Uh, and so as anti-polygamy legislation gets rolling in the 1860s and the 1870s, uh, Latter-day Saint women are very public actors. They hold what they call indignation meetings. Uh, in, in, in the largest of these indignation meetings, called the Great Indignation Meeting, they met in the tabernacle, 5,000 of them, and spoke, defending themselves, defending their lifestyle, defending their faith in, in, in very strong, very powerful terms. This happens in 1870. It's about that same period of time uh, that Latter-day Saint women ask for the right to vote. Uh, and, and part of this is connected with anti-polygamy legislation. Uh, the, the idea has been floated in Congress, well, let's give Mormon women the right to vote, and they'll vote out Brigham Young and all those other guys. And Latter-day Saints women said, yeah, we'll take you up on that. Yeah, yeah and, 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 and they, they received the right to vote from the legislature, become the first women in the country to actually exercise that right at the ballot box. Yeah, what's with Wyoming beating them like on paper? Well, how did that happen? Because like women in Wyoming get it on paper. Right. Women in Utah first to vote. You know, just you know, they if you, if you move there. quickly, yeah. <laughs> we're happy for both states. <laughs> so with with the um, uh, women's suffrage becoming an issue for the Relief Society, how how about um, Kate or Jill? How about some of your thoughts about uh, how the politics played out for the Relief Society and what that meant for Latter Day Saint women? Because publicly, like. Matt said they would um, champion uh, their position. Privately, we know that there were there was some heartache, there was sorrow, there was difficulties. It's just uh, within polygamous marriages there was difficulties. Within monogamous marriages there were difficulties. So privately, uh, things were probably more difficult than what they presented publicly. Um, how do you reckon with that? This this uh, collection of documents is is really focused on more institutional documents. So we don't uh, so much see the private side of of plural marriage. Um, yes, I think it was it was difficult for a lot of women, and we have we have diaries and reminiscences and letters in the archives, many many accounts published that show the the challenge that plural marriage presented in many families. Uh, as you say, marriage is differed. Some some polygamous families learned uh, ways to make it work, and others it worked less well. And for some women, it clearly was very painful. I think uh, th that aside, you, you have the sense that this was a, a, a principle that defined Latter-day Saints in the 19th century. And so it, it was hard to separate out being a Latter-day Saint from being a defender of of plural marriage, uh, because it it became a, 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 a central principle for those living it and for those not living it. So you have you have someone like Sarah M. Kimball, who is not a a plural wife, uh, speaking in defense of the the Latter-day Saints and speaking very strongly against the anti-polygamy legislation, which she sees as, as hurting men whom she, she loves and other women whom she loves, splitting up families. So yes, there's a, there's a tension there, certainly, but there's a, there's a great effort to defend uh, the church as a whole, and they don't, they don't separate out plural marriage at this point. So for them, defending polygamy is, is in, related to defending their whole way of life. It's important to remember, too, that suffrage wasn't only about plural marriage. That these women believed that when Joseph Smith turned the key at that Nauvoo Relief Society meeting, he was making it possible to emancipate women all over the world. And women in Relief Society were working to make life better, as they could, for women all over the world. And so suffrage was one of those rights that they wanted for women throughout the world to have. 
people, as they read these documents, will see the fascinating stories it plays out because even the women's suffrage movement was complex and there were different perspectives within the movement and there were people that weren't comfortable with Latter-day Saint women being involved and other people who were. And so history is always... It's always more interesting than you'd think when you start digging into the uh, to the documents. So in 1892, they have a year of jubilee. This is the 50-year anniversary of the Relief Society. And you uh, kind of wrap up the book um, w with some documents from that uh, where they celebrate uh, 50 years. And uh, I like this quote um, from the introductory material of that section where you say, as they honored the past, women looked forward to a future with all new challenges and possibilities. So this book actually ends with, there's an open ending here. There's a sense of not only continuity, looking at the past, but also recognizing the, uh, the fact that future always brings change. How did you reckon with that idea of change uh, as it played itself out throughout this book? I think calling the Nauvoo Minutes the Constitution instead of having a separate constitution is an invitation to have a living church that's flexible, that operates on continuing revelation, and that moves forward and, and changes according to changing contexts and changing needs. We see the Relief Society, it's often ignored, continue to do really exciting things throughout the entire 20th century. And members of Relief Society on their own or individual Relief Societies continuing to do Im important and exciting things. That's Kate Holbrook. Together with Matt Groh and Jill Mulvader, she edited the first 50 years of Relief Society, key documents in Latter-day Saint women's history. I wanted to close by talking about history in general. So um, Matt and Jill, both of you have noted how the publication of this book complicates two common assumptions that people make about church history. I, I saw you talking about this uh, in, in, in a different interview. So there's these these two common assumptions. First, that the idea that the story of women in the church is just a story of increasing restriction. It's a story of loss. Uh, so there's that story. The second uh, story is the idea that women in Mormonism uh, is just triumphant progress that's brought us to the present time and all is well now and everything's exactly as it should be and it's just this glorious time. And you've suggested that neither of these stories accurately accounts for what we find in the actual records. So Matt, I, uh, I'd like you to speak to that first sort of myth about loss and then Jill, if you could speak to the second about uh, triumphant history. Thanks. Yeah, there is, there has been a uh, narrative, I think, particularly in, in the scholarly literature, but also in, in, the, in the public arena, that, uh, that Latter-day Saint women have lost authority, autonomy, power that they once had. Uh, and, and, and the story is so much more complex than that. Uh, so, we, and, and, and to emphasize the narrative of loss, you have to really pick and choose what you're talking about. Right, so if you're saying relief societies no longer control their own budgets in the way they did in the 1930s or the 1880s, that's correct. Or their granaries, like they had their own granaries, right. and then right, they, yeah, right. Or uh, or or you can focus on faith healing, right, to to talk about that uh, that narrative of loss, but that ignores so much else uh, in that that was occurring in that very patriarchal culture of the 1800s. And women didn't serve missions. Uh, sometimes they accompanied their husbands. Women very rarely spoke before mixed-gendered audiences, so that means they didn't speak in sacrament meetings. They very rarely spoke in, 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 in conference-type uh, settings. And then uh, by a, a, a great number of them were plural wives. Uh, and and, and uh, so you, putting a, a few other issues on the table, <laughs> you can see that it's a much more complex narrative uh, uh, to get today, and I, not to I, say that anybody couldn't feel bad about any of the things they perceive as losses, right? right? But, no, but the fact no. that that's just not the whole story, right? It's just not the whole story, and, and 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 we're not saying that there's no pain that's gone along with with some of those changes that have occurred. Clearly, that's the case, right? But it's just a much more complex story. There's ups and downs to this story. Uh, there's uh, nuance, and and what we hope people get out of this book is a, a more complex understanding of that history. That simple narratives just don't work. So that's so much for that idea of 
the narrative of loss. Yes, there's been loss. The story is more complex. Um, that's a fair point. On the flip side of that is the idea that it's, people sometimes call it Whig history, this idea that things just get better and better uh, and it's triumphant to this glorious day. So, Jill, uh, what, what do you think about that sort of story? Well, Blair, let me, let me start by talking something about my own experience in doing women's history and uh, probably having some of that sense of triumph myself. Uh, when I when I was in my 20s, I started working at the historical department and started discovering Mormon women's lives uh, for the first time ever. I I didn't even know who Eliza R. Snow was uh, when I began working there, except that she was a writer of hymns. Uh, I think to to start to unpack information about these lives, little known facts. Uh, there's a there's a great feeling of exhilaration in discovering these heroines one has never heard of or known, uh, at least there was for me. And seeing their achievements is exciting. Looking at their 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 founding of a hospital, their founding of a newspaper, their uh, their engagement in in raising silk or saving grain or later in the 20th century, their involvement in establishing social services or uh, publishing their own magazine and actually being able to to get it into color and get it into Spanish. And uh, these these are great and exciting achievements. And I, I do think it's easy to want to to celebrate them and especially to romanticize the more distant past and uh, I think we we can do uh, a lot of that but as has as Matt has observed these these very women like uh, Eliza R. Snow or Zina D. H. Young, Emmeline B. Wells who seem the epitome of strength and and power uh, also dealt with some some challenges in conducting the affairs of Relief Society in in setting up structures that uh, they felt were right that sometimes men opposed uh, in in moving forward with with bishops who were resistant. Uh, it's a it's a much more complex story, and so there's not there's not uh, unmitigated triumph. Uh, it is a story of ups and downs, and it's a story of discussions and conversations and negotiations. And uh, I think that's probably the most important thing that that I have learned here, uh, that, that the church isn't a set of rules and uh, people who obey them or choose not to obey them. It's a, a series of attempts and discussions and successes and failures and uh, mistakes and compassion and, and negotiation. And I, for me, that's been immensely helpful. I think it's a, it's a much firmer foundation to, to build upon. Uh, even though we, we believe in revelation, we believe in access to divine power, it doesn't, it doesn't mean for a smooth uh, trajectory of, of living out those principles and those revelations. What you're saying is the kind of thing that I get out of looking at our history. And I hear some people talk about how it doesn't seem to seep into our Sunday church meetings very often, some of the church manuals. It seems like some of the stuff that the Church Historians Press would be putting out hasn't filtered through as quickly. Um, do you foresee a time when more church lessons would draw on the types of materials that you all have been working on and where um, that type of story that you've laid out there would, would be more widely understood by church members. I think we're actually seeing a lot of progress in that. Uh, if you look at uh, the Gospel Topics essays, they present a much more complex, nuanced version of history, including this history, the essays uh, that were published in October on Joseph Smith's teachings about temple, priesthood, and women, and, 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 and the essay on Mother in Heaven. Uh, with, with the other products from the Church Historians Press, like the Joseph Smith Papers, uh, we have seen integration into of of the resources into curriculum, even into the headings of the scriptures, right? So um, certainly, 
Uh, some people hope that uh, change happens more quickly than it happens. But, but I actually, I, I see a lot of progress. I'm really hopeful that, uh, that this uh, more complex story is being interwoven into, into how we teach, how we talk about history. And I think the same thing will happen with this book. Uh, I, certainly we hope, like the Joe Smith Papers, that future writers of curriculum or manuals will draw on the stories, will draw on the discussions here, will draw on the quotations. Uh, to help present the history of the Relief Society, the history of women in the church in, in, in a much more full context. Yeah, these are the types of things I want so badly for my daughter to understand, yeah. and, and my son too, right? It's right. Women's history is not, not right. just for her, so um, it, it's really valuable, I think, to see the church working on these types of projects. What do we miss, though, with a textual record? Because this is just a book. Take maybe just a second to talk about some of the things that, if we only focused on the documents, what we might miss uh, from pertaining especially to Latter-day Saint women experience? Well, we, we do have a nice 800-page book here that contains documents that relate specifically to women, and many of them are women speaking um, records of women's own words. But a lot of women's labor did not get recorded, a lot of their contributions, a lot of their thinking. And that's when material culture research becomes particularly important, when you can look at a quilt and and see the story the quilt is telling and the priorities that went into the making of the quilt and what the quilt represents about the unity of the women who came together to produce it and why they produced it. I, I study food habits, so for me, I like to look at a recipe and, and say, what what were they trying to accomplish with this recipe? Who were they trying to appeal to? What, what bridges were they trying to build? You know, a lot of people brought favorite recipes back from the mission f field with them, and, and I, I, I love the... I want to say spiritual ecumenism, but what I mean is the, the the embracing of other cultures that people do in the mission field and then bring home and try to integrate into their own family and social cultures. The melting stew pot? <laughs> yeah. does, that, does that work? There's a beautiful picture in here of a banner that... Uh, that was made. That's one of the like material culture things that stood out that I really liked. That was made using Eliza Snow's silk, I think, and that 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 they used at the Jubilee. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Is is that at the Church History Museum now, or where where is that at? It is at the Church History Museum, and I don't know that it will be put on display because of its uh, delicate nature. Yeah. But I I believe at some moments in time in 1992 for the 150th anniversary. I believe a, a replica was made and placed on display. These, Where'd the photo come from? Do you know if that was a new photo that? That, that photo is from the Church History Museum. Okay. They, they took a new photo for, for us. Uh, but you're right, you look at uh, quilts or you look at a banner like this and uh, the very words they choose to use or in this case, the the symbols, the the dove with the olive branch, all of these are susceptible of of varying interpretations that enhance our understanding of what women were thinking. Yeah, I just wanted people to keep that in mind. Like, I love documents, mm -hmm. but but I'm also excited by uh, material culture and, and new avenues of research that people are opening up. So, Jill, you talked a little bit about um, your past of being involved with. Uh, Mormon history for a really long time. Have you seen any kind of changes over the course of your career uh, in the way that Mormon women's history has been addressed within the church? Uh, I think I think the initial impulse was to uh, compensate for the absence of of women in the church narrative, and um, so uh, the first rush was this compensatory history. So you. You come up with the the great leaders, the Eliza R. Snow, uh, or the the doctors, the Martha Hughes Cannon. You you come up with the the figures who are notable in the same way that men have been notable. I think a a, a different kind of thrust was was women's personal experience, and there have been wonderful diaries and and letters and autobiographies published in recent years to get at the experience of individual women. Uh, and of course, there's been some institutional history done over time as well. 
been uh, more forays, I think, into theological questions um, and sociological questions regarding plural marriage, for example. So I think the, the field has really broadened as, as time has moved forward. Uh, I do think at this moment in time, we don't want to, to lose the experience, the, the singular experience of, of women. But I think with this book and, and hopefully with projects coming down the road, we'll see a, a more integrated history. And uh, that way of seeing the past will probably inform the way we see our own relationships in the present and, and look to uh, relationships in the future within the church organization and within our families. Is that, Kate, how, is that how you see it playing out, too? Because you're newer to the field, so... Mm -hmm. I th well, there, there seems to be... Maybe it's a mini-explosion, but so many exciting ways that, that people are approaching Mormon history now and Mormon women's history now, sometimes focusing more on women, sometimes focusing on integration, hopefully never leaving women out of the story anymore. Hopefully we're beyond that now. Uh, people traveling to Africa and to India to do oral histories with female members there. There are just lots of ways that people are approaching both collecting history and presenting history now. And I think it's really important too, Jill, that, that you pointed out that it's not, we don't need to think of it as just, here's Mormon women's history and here's Mormon history. That Mormon women's history is Mormon history and we're seeing that integration increase, uh, and, and I've seen that sort of playing out as well. It's exciting. Uh, for you, Matt, you're out of the four volume editors, the only uh, man. So talk maybe about your role in that process. Uh, this is a book of women's documents. Did you did you ever feel like <laughs> you're sort of imposing? You're this guy coming in to sort of you know. How, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not self-aware enough to notice if I'm posing or not. But <laughs> no, it was it was just a tremendous opportunity to work on the book. Uh, when I began working on the book, I knew very little about Relief Society history, so it was a tremendous learning experience uh, for me. Looking back on on, on the project, I, I really love the final product. Uh, but if I were to change one thing about it, I would take out the word women's in the title. So see, it says key documents in Latter-day Saint women's history, and I I, I think uh, we do need to get beyond this assumption that women's history or the history of the Relief Society should be written mostly by women, should be read mostly by women, uh, and just understand that for anyone who wa who wants to understand the 19th century church, if you want to understand 19th century church economic activities, political activities, spiritual activities, ecclesiastical activities, you'd better understand the history of the Relief Society. That's Matt Groh, together with Jill Mulvader and Kate Holbrook, and Carol cornwall Matson, who didn't join us today, but will be uh, doing some appearances uh, with you all to talk about the book. Uh, and as you're listening to this episode uh, today, um, we're recording this. Actually, we're recording this on International Women's Day, uh, interestingly oh. enough. <laughs> uh, but this episode will appear uh, the week of the anniversary of the Relief Society. And, and Jill, you'll be speaking uh, at the Tabernacle, it is? At the Assembly Hall, 7 o'clock, March 17th. Okay, so uh, people that are listening to this can uh, can check that out. Thank you guys so much for talking about this book. It's been a, a real uh, pleasure to go through the book and to meet with you about it. Thank you. Thanks, Blair. Thanks, Blair.